So welcome, everybody. It's really good to be back in person with all of you. Um, so this talk today is about a paper that I've also released today, at least in its first public uh, sharing. And I'll have the URL for that at the end of my talk. Um, I'm Clea Young, also known as Identity Woman. And since we last talked, I have a new business partner that I'm working with, Lucy Yang. She's up here in the front, but she had nothing to do with writing this paper. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on the materialist approach to the world uh, that I took in writing this paper. Explain SSI in 30 seconds, because I'm assuming a lot of you already know what it is. Touch on the histor history of architectures of computer-based identity systems. Spend the bulk of my time on the context and the deep historical context for paper-based identity systems and how they arose. Look at the shape of paper-based identity systems and then understand how that contrasts with the computer-based systems that I talked about earlier. And then finally look at why I think SSI-based systems are in alignment with Western liberal democratic values. So 20 minutes, here we go. So, oh, this is a jumpy, okay, touch lightly. There we go. So one of the things to remember, and actually Steve Wilson, who just spoke earlier, was talking about this as well, is that we tend to make identity about things. And really, identity is about process. So everything that exists results from emergent processes over time. And so our lives as human beings in bodies are the result of processes. And both the human person and their identity documents that have a physicality, but how they came to be, the processes of their creation is as important as their thingness. So how you got the identity card is as important as the card itself. And I think sometimes we are forgetting this. And by looking at processes, we can understand crucial differences between different systems. And so that's what I'm going to do in this talk. So self-sovereign identity. Um, this is a classic diagram of SSI, where you have on the left the issuer that creates a credential the holder who is given the credential by the issuer and the holder can choose which verifiers and where they share them. And below are um, a key aspect of this technology as well, which is where you can go look up the public keys needed. Uh, the public keys are posted by the issuer and they're used by the verifier. And you also have trust registries in this layer as well. Trying to figure out who that issuer is and should you trust them needs to be solved. And this is just a quick little diagram from the decentralized identifier specification, sort of sharing what it looks like. But this talk is not about these. There are many talks here where you can go learn about it. So now I'm going to go through a set of history that many of you probably know. But in order to contrast SSI, we need to understand these digital, digital systems. So the very first computers. The ENIAC and the Colossus had no accounts whatsoever. They did one thing, and they had operators who ran them, and that was it. So then you go to post-World War, World War II computing in the 1950s, and you start to have computers in academic institutions, and they start to think about time sharing and using having different Researchers use those computers at different times. And by the 1960s, you have mainframes that have user accounts on them and messaging between accounts. So we can think of this as like proto-email. And we have the ARPANET gets formed, domain names get created. This is Jake Fleener, who uh, was in the lab, who created the first domain names. And proto-emails start to get sent. And then real emails, like using these DNS systems between computers in other parts of the country. Then, of course, you have 
Enterprise Identity Access Management comes in and you have LDAP, so it's directories of who is an employee. And these are very top-down control structures where employees are getting identifiers in these employee systems. And this continues with CML, Enterprise SSO, Enterprise Federation. So these all have username and passwords at the core of how they're managing these accounts across these systems. And then you have the beginning of the consumer internet. And these all used usernames and passwords when you wanted to get to them. So this paradigm that started out as a thing from mainframes in the 60s gets you usernames and passwords. And this continued in web two, you could have hundreds of accounts in different systems. And then we invented um, partly at the conference I host called the Internet Identity Workshop, OAuth and OpenID. But you see, in these systems, you're still getting an identifier from an identity provider and returning back to them to do authentication. And this is the model kind of that we had when we're trying to figure this stuff out like 10, even five years ago. This was the predominant model. So, we're trying to figure out how to do computer-based identity systems, and we have paper-based systems in the real world. And these have been around for 500 years, and the antecedents for them go back 1,500 years, and that's what I'm gonna talk about in this section. So this is a deep context of why paper-based systems arose. So, like, I'm sure many of you, I did a bunch of reading during the pandemic, and this is one of the books I read. How We Became a Our Data, A Genealogy of the Informational Person. And it's a really great history where he says, why, I'll do, read the quote, this is from him, I suggest that bringing the politics of information into view requires extending the scope of our historical analysis to the period preceding wartime information sciences and the post-war information theory to which they gave rise. So he's like, why when Shannon et al. create information theory in 1948, does it get widely accepted and become well understood pretty quickly? And he goes and says, well, for the previous 50 years, we were filling out forms, being evaluated, and you know, this was all happening, so it just made sense. I read another book during the pandemic, The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. And then uh, some dots got connected. So many of the histories of modern identity systems often begin in the Middle Ages with letters of introduction, very early birth certificates coming from church baptismal records, census receipts, citizenship papers. And they all began you know, around 1500 in Europe. But what happened before that in the preceding thousand years? Why did these technologies of identity, paper-based identity, make sense to people who adopted them around this time? What happened? that made this technology of identity documentation acceptable. So, this is the key thing that I take away from the book is that in the year 500, the Catholic Church imposed a marriage and family program. And this little map below, the green is the spread of the church in 400, and the yellow is the spread of the church um, 200 years later in 600, so right around this time. So this whole area was covered by these things. And what it did is it banned cousin marriages up to seventh cousins, which is seven, sharing an ancestor seven generations above you. It's 140 years. Okay. And they did another thing. They also banned marriages to people that you were related to, but not by blood. So if a man was married to one sister and she died, he was prohibited in church law from marrying the, another sister because they were 
brother and sister-in-law. The in-law from that term comes from church law. And so what did this do? This broke up cousin marriages, and it, it broke apart over hundreds of years intensive kin-based institutions that linked people together based on family ties. And kin-based institutions organized production, provided security, and gave people a sense of meaning and identity. And you could not leave them. They were your kin. It was all kind of running. So this map shows the extent of the Roman Catholic Church in 1000. So you can see it's expanded, and more and more people are being subjected to this marriage and family policy than these kin-based institutions are bringing up, breaking up. So without these kin-based institutions, individuals were both socially compelled and personally motivated to relocate and seek out like-minded others for voluntary associations and engage with strangers. So it's in the period between 1000 and the 1300 that you see an explosion in the number of monasteries. The first universities are formed and towns are formed with people moving in from the countryside and meeting new people. And what this did was it shaped a proto-weird psychology. Um, you had analytic thinking, and this grew from the importance of people navigating a world of individuals rather than dense family interconnections, reducing the importance and value of holistic thinking. You had internal attribution, a social life shifted to the individual, traits and dispositions, preferences, personalities, as well as mental states, like beliefs, intentions become important. And soon lawyers and theologians begin to imagine that people have rights. You have independence and nonconformity. In a society with weak kin ties and impersonal markets, individual focused on their uniqueness rather than venerating ancient wisdom and elders. And finally, impersonal pro-sociality. With life being governed by impersonal norms for dealing with strangers, people came to prefer impartial laws that applied to their groups or communities, their cities, guilds, monasteries, independent of older social relationships, tribal identity, or social class. And so as these kin-based institutions dissolved, medieval Europeans became increasingly free to move, both relationally and residentially, released to choose their own associates, their friends, spouses, business partners, even patrons, constructing their own relational networks, opened the door to the development and spread of voluntary associations, including these types of institutions. So now that you're in institutions that are not kin-based, how do you know who belongs? And I argue that you have the origins of these contemporary institutions and the origin of identity documents happening and feeding each other. Because when you're in a guild, you have to know who the members are. When you're in a town, you need to know who the residents are. When you're in the military, the state needs to know who's, who are the soldiers in those units and how much you're paying them. And institutions like hospital, you need to know who the medical patient's on, and the list can, the list can extend farther. Oh, did we go too fast? OK. So why did identity systems of institutions emerge when they did, and why did people adopt these technologies? And I assert it's because these newly emergent assemblages were not defined by familial and genetic ties, and they had to find ways to support defining who had entered the boundary of the institution. So these documents become boundary creation mechanisms. And the one technology available to do this was paper-based record-keeping systems, be it a logbook of like listing who had joined, cabinet files. And these were both ways of tracking who was in a social formation or assemblage but it could also involve a letter or certificate given to the person themselves, right? So these are these early 
early forms of identity documents. And you can sort of see this is the shape of a paper-based identity system. You have a guild that would issue, like you passed all of the, the tests you need to do to be qualified to practice this skill. The subject would hold this piece of paper and they could share it to a potential employer or someone seeking their skills, but also potentially to another chapter in another city, right? Because you're also talking about these things spreading beyond just one local context, but networking across Europe as well. And importantly, they have a record of who is in the guild themselves, right? So you have these two forms of documentation. And now, so with this you have boundary formation where who's in and who's out is shaped by these tools. And this is an important property of life itself. I am me because I have skin and I have an inside and an outside. This hotel has a boundary, its walls. And so this is a key aspect of what happens. And the other thing that happens with these new institutions is they come up with novel forms of governance. Because when you're in a kin-based institution, it's really clear how they're governed. They're governed by the oldest guy in the room, and these hierarchies are very clear. And so what happens is there's this flowering of experimentations in how they should be governed, and the seeds of early democracy are found in these institutions and how they figure out how to govern themselves, they write charters, and more successful models of government spread farther um, and are picked up by other institutions. And you also, in this time, see pre-capitalist markets forming. And in these markets, you're interacting with strangers, and as you're interacting with strangers, emergence of social norms for how to do that, back to the pro-social, um, um, being pro-social with strangers, so this helps these markets function, but you also end up with the early seeds of commercial law forming, and you also have contracts, and to write a contract, you have to have an identity to articulate who you are and who the other party is, and then use those contracts to access justice where parties are mediating these disputes, right? So you have new institutions, you have this new psychology of how people saw themselves as individual with identities of their own relative to these institutions, and you have pre-digital identity systems that have a material logic formed mainly by the physical reality of paper, which was the available substrate to manage these systems. And so this is the same picture we just had, but it's a more contemporary example where Births are registered at a county register, a paper birth certificate is issued to the individual, and a record of the birth is done in a county registration system, and individuals are able to use that birth certificate to present to potential employers. This touches on a little nugget of history, which is like, why do we have universal birth registration in the United States? Because we didn't always have it, and we have it because social reformers in the early, early part of the 20th century were really against child labor. And parents were lying about the age of their children to get them into the labor market. And they're like, uh-uh, you have to show us a birth certificate so we know when your kid was born so you aren't putting in the, them in the labor market too early. Anyways, so now we can look at the alignment of SSI with these liberal democratic values so back to where we left off, the computer-based iPhone home identity systems. All of the computer-based identity systems that were designed in the 70 years of computers all had the same kind of architecture, an identifier by system, you had a username or password or some other authentication method, and you're always going back to that. And that is quite different than this shape, which is the shape of a self-sovereign identity system, where you have an educational institution issuing a verifiable credential to the subject, and then that subject being able to make a verifiable presentation to the potential employer and say, yes, I have this degree. And what we have below is the posting of a DID doc via the public web distributed ledger or blockchain, 
and a registration and governance framework relative to educational institutions. And so if we look at these two shapes, the former shape being weird originated paper-based identity systems and SSI, they look very similar, which is why I believe these, the, the way we've been doing identity for 500 years and its antecedents in the previous thousand years are aligned with SSI. And I argue that there is a non-alignment between these phone home digital identity systems and paper-based systems. And so this is the punchline. We've got this timeline of the computer-based systems on, on the left-hand side. We have these paper-based documents on the right and that self-sovereign identity is the right place for them to meet and not earlier in this timeline. I think it can explain why systems like, or proposed systems like the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace and other efforts have failed beforehand and that SSI has a good chance of succeeding because of its natural alignment with these systems that we've been developing for hundreds of years. So with that, I will invite you to go read the paper and take any questions that you have. Yay, thank you. That's a great question. I think that um, it is not the implication. <laughs> um, I think that, I, and I say this in the paper, for better or worse, Western institutions, because of some of their qualities that I just outlined in the talk, have spread everywhere, right, around the world. And they're not the only way to do things. I also talk about you know, um, indigenous communities that are still kin-based exploring using SSI to document their membership, right? So it's not so much, um, yeah, so I'm not saying that, but I'm also trying to like draw this line through um, Western history to say this is, these two line up and the computer-based history doesn't line up unless you get to SSI. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. I think that um, um, for those of you who were in the room before this talk, I caught the end of the last talk and it was somebody saying that we should have one identity our entire lives and use it everywhere. And I was like, like, no, like part of the weirdness is that you end up presenting yourself differently in different contexts and manage context proactively to separate different pieces of your life that you don't want to connect. Now, this is possible. This was not possible back to when we started this in 500. You were one person in your one little place and you were basically never going to escape it unless something really dramatic happened. Right, and I think, totally. So I think there's kind of like, how do, we, how do we not keep going down the extreme, but potentially use SSI in these new, you know, this is some of what's going on in Web3 is like, how do we make DAOs and be accountable to each other and build more relational 
exchanges than just the pure market, right? But we don't want to do that all in public with everybody seeing everything we do, which is something like the soul-bound token people have put out in the last few weeks. I'm like, yeah, Dave. Yes. But Uh-huh. The thing is if you put people in charge of their own identity, they'll they'll whip them to Facebook for a snickers bar. So I, look, do you let do But do people have physical wallets where they store different cards in? Right, so I, I believe that we're going to have, I believe we're going to end up in a system much more like that, where people will have custodians that are, have a fiduciary duty to them, and if they violate that, then they get in trouble, but we don't have that right now. We have Facebook sitting there in an IDP versus like a identity data bank thing that has a legal obligation to help me manage my identity and not exploit me and not, never let me leave data bank, identity data bank things. There's companies that are talking about providing those services and potentially the existing fiduciaries we have today, like banks. Like, yes? So I think they're quite different. I think you're confusing data brokers, which is one type of domain of identity. I wrote a whole book about domains of identity and uh, banks that hold bank accounts for individuals. They're different. So I'm proposing that we have a network of, like we do in the United States, there's like 3,500 banks Yes. And who is the steering company? Not me, right? They have customers. Yeah. So, so that, that's a market, and that's going to get changed where the market is going to get. But um, yeah, it's different than actually shopping. Mike. So I actually believe all this is definitely going to happen. No question. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I love it. I think Web3 stuff is accelerating this. If you look at the SSI companies that have raised the most money in the last six months, Hopefully not a Bitcoin. They're, 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 Disco XYZ raised $9 million, and Spruce ID raised $7 million in the fall and $34 million, like in the winter. Transmit raised half a billion dollars. Who? Transmit Securities. What, what do they do? The okay. So, but, but you know, I think that that's the, the time is the big question, right? But I have a question. Okay, are we, so you said that I was the last person, but you were wrong. Okay. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. And if you want to do materialism, he's great.